Um, okay, uh, so we are um, starting the second lecture in the context of uh, Pride uh, Queer Studies 2022. Uh, our guest is uh, Slobodan Marković, a full professor of the Faculty of the Political Sciences, and uh, he will tell us what he's going to talk about right now. Okay. Thank you, Dushan. Thank you for coming to this lecture, and thank you for organizing not only this event, but also other events in queer studies in Belgrade for starting this discipline here in Serbia. Uh, today, I will speak about the contribution of two disciplines, sexology and cultural anthropology, to the understanding and acceptance of same-sex relations in Western societies. So basically, how these two disciplines contributed to the world that we now live in, which is actually radically different from the world only 120 years ago, and we may not be very much aware of it. So what was the situation 120 years ago, like about 1900? First of all, since the French Revolution, the ideal of new man was heterosexual. This by no means that heteronormativity was the only kind of normativity in European history. But since the French Revolution, it began to be a prevailing model. And in spite of uh, legalization, the first legalization of same-sex relations that happened during the French Revolution in 1791, so this is a really great event, but in spite of that, during even the French Revolution, and especially during the Age of Terror, the final period of the French Revolution, enemies of the fatherland and the revolution were sodomites, the then uh, used term to describe people of homosexual or, and bisexual orientation. During the 19th century, and especially during its second half, Victorian repressive sexual morality prevailed throughout bourgeois Europe, and then through European imperialism and cultural transfer this type of uh, morality spread all around the world. So today, we attribute certain laws in traditional, we call them traditional, uh, Islamic societies to Islam, but actually many of those countries imported anti-homosexual laws from the British Empire, exactly in this period. Why? Because the period between 1860 and 1945 is now considered as the climax of uh, hegemonic and militarized masculinity. So armies shaped masculinity in a way that was very disciplined, totally heteronormative, with man as the center of universe and the center of political life and power. Uh, that then was transferred also to civilian aspects of life. As a very well-known expert uh, from Vienna, very well-known professor, uh, and one of the major experts in history of sexuality in Europe now, noticed everything, everything indeed, ideational, material, body-related, moral, habitual, turns into sexual dichotomy and is asymmetrically marked by superior masculinity, describing the situation during this period of hegemonic masculinity. There was a reaction, finally, to this, and something that we must be aware of. This is also the period when modern nations are invented. But once invented tradition becomes stabilized, people start to think that it was always like that. El tempore. So, the French nation, as it is in 1900, was the same in 1800, 1700. Because there is heteronormativity in 1900, and because there, is, there are some patriarchal traits, 
It must have been like that always. Even people like Freud believed in that. And with this uh, hegemonic masculinity, cultural repression, sexual repression became also reached its peak. And as a result, we are not surprised to see uh, that certain scholars, scientists, found out that a lot of people were affected by what Freud called neurosis. Stefan Zweig, who witnessed all of that, wrote his autobiography just at the outbreak of the Second World War. And he noticed in this autobiography called The World of Yesterday, But this fear of everything physical and natural dominated the whole people, from the highest to the lowest, with the violence of an actual neurosis describing Viennese society. And Viennese reaction to Victorian morality was that a series of sexologists, writers, reacted to it. Sexologists like Richard von Kraft Ebbing, actually doctor, he wouldn't have called himself sexologist, Sigmund Freud, who would not object to the term, and then writers like Arthur Schnitzler and Stefan Zweig. American reaction to Puritanism, which is another word for the same thing for Victorian morality, was uh, in anthropology, uh, personified by Margaret Mead, and in sexology by Dr. Alfred Kinsey. And German reaction is personified by Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld, Finally, British discontent was ramified in the works of psychologist, sexologist Evel Ellis. And I will say something about every and each of them. But what is important is that the 20th century is sometimes described as the century of the South. There is a BBC series about that. In the 20th century, people for the first time realized that there was the realm of the unconscious that there were dreams, and the dreams and reality somehow interacted. Of course, people were aware of dreams and interpretation of dreams as, el as old as human civilization. But for the first time, this was uh, analytically analyzed, especially by Sigmund Freud. And his work, Interpretation of Dreams, that was published at the very turn of the century, in a way, ushers in an era of disquietude, an era of uneasiness. Uh, some authors describe atmosphere in Vienna at the turn of the century as atmosphere of joyous apocalypse. So what did Freud say? First of all, what did he say in general terms that is important for our topic? How same-sex relations are accepted gradually. First of all, he said that dreams reveal what humans really desire. And what follows from that is that sexual fantasies, and human dreams are full of sexual fantasies, represent humans' deepest wishes. So if you have fantasies of having intimate relations with the same sex, they also represent our deepest wishes, for instance. Humans are deeply ambivalent, and repression of sexuality leads to neurosis. What is important to say is that Sigmund Freud was very unlike his theories that were very revolutionary at that stage. To say that these sexual fantasies affect everyone, to say that uh, sexual drive exists even among children, Children were desexualized by Christianity. He resexualized children. To say that uh, children may have a sexual identification with one or the other parent, <coughs> this was all totally unacceptable to Victorian mentality of that day. That was totally revolutionary. We cannot imagine what would be an equivalent today. But in private life, Freud was conventional. He had petit bourgeois taste. And his own disciples, Ernest Jones and Fritz Wittels, called him Puritan. Moreover, Fritz Wittels 
claimed that Viennese cafes proclaimed an imminent revolution in our sexual mores, of which Freud, strictly conventional in his private life, would have preferred to hear as little as possible. He even practiced sexual abstention from a very early age, uh, whether he had an affair with his sister in law or not, does not really change the whole thing too much. Uh, so what did he say about humans? First of all, humans are creatures of unfulfilled desires. Sex, uh, secondly, they are dominantly irrational. Human rationality is very limited. The ego is surrounded by three tyrants, he says, the conscious, the unconscious, and the hostile outside world. So the realm of the unconscious is huge. And we will see later what we can find in that realm. And that essentially meant that he challenged the ideas of enlightenment that humans were very rational. And finally, there is no major difference in Freud's original ideas between pathology and mental sanity. In addition to this, Freud's theory of sexuality has a lot of elements on bi in which he discusses bisexuality and homosexuality. First of all, he believed that a certain degree of anatomical hermaphroditism occurs normally. Also, that bisexual disposition is somehow concerned in inversion, another word for homosexuality. However, he was not, he oscillated in his analysis why homosexuality appeared. Because at that time, he believed that there must have been some reason and he was there to analyze it. So, first of all, he believed that it could be a product of the fear of castration among boys, which of course wouldn't explain homosexual orientation among women at all, or pathological identification with mother of a boy, again, or inability to identify with father, again, it, it is very much uh, um, androcentric. It is very much centered on males only, the whole thing, right? But what is important for us is that in a footnote to the 1915 edition of Free Essays on Sexuality, he stated the following. Psychoanalytic research is most decidedly opposed to any attempt at separating off homosexuals from the rest of mankind as a group of a special character. By studying sexual excitations other than those that are manifestly displayed. It has found that all human beings are capable of making a homosexual object choice and have in fact made one in their unconscious. Indeed, libidinal attachments to persons of the same sex play no less a part as factors in normal mental life and the greater part as a motive force for illness than do similar attachments to the opposite sex. On the contrary, psychoanalysis consider that the choice of an object independently of its sex, freedom to range equally over male and female objects as it is found in childhood, in primitive states, in society and early periods of history, is the original basis from which as a result of restriction in one direction or the other, both the normal and the inverted types develop. So this was revolutionary for that age. It may not seem to you at all, but it was revolutionary because in mainstream, homosexuality was considered as a mental disease, a disorder, abnormality, something that was, by the way, incurable for, by, for many of uh, researchers who uh, advocated such attitudes, but nonetheless, it was labeled and stigmatized very clearly. Then he added another footnote, which is very important in terms of conversion theory, which some of his disciples later practiced. And he said there 
it would be unjustifiable to assert that these interesting experiments, and experiments were about experimental castration, grafting the sex glands of the opposite sex, conducted by some biologists, he says that it is unjustifiable to assert that these interesting experiments put the theory of inversion on a new basis, and it would be hasty to expect them to offer a universal means of curing homosexuality. Fliss has rightly insisted, his friend, uh, who probably had some homoerotic uh, attachment to him, Fliss has rightly insisted that these experimental findings do not invalidate the theory of the general bisexual disposition of the higher animals. On the contrary, it seems to me probable that further research of a similar kind will produce a direct confirmation this presumption of bisexuality. So to say that elementally humans are bisexual doesn't mean that in reality they would realize and would appear as bisexuals, but that elementally they are like that. That was really outrageous from the point of view of the age in which he lived in. But what happened? What happened was that now that psychoanalytic movement was to appear, a question arose. Could there be gay psychoanalysts? And Freud remained alone in psychoanalytic movement in claiming that homosexuality was not a disease, that it was not a mental disorder. Only Shandar Ferenc, and these are main psychoanalysts here, supported him. He supported ideas that gay people could be psychoanalysts in his letters to Jones and Rank, but Karl Abraham from Berlin was particularly against that, since homosexuals could not be cured from their perversion, he claimed. And for Ernest Jones, homosexuality was also a disease, and he was the second person in terms of influence in the movement. And as a result of that, psychoanalysis became hostile to homosexuals and remained hostile until the 1970s. So there is a very complicated legacy Freud totally opened up this avenue of thinking to all these directions. He clearly said that uh, what later became conversion therapy wouldn't work. He clearly said that the chance to cure a <coughs> homosexual person and turn that person into heterosexual is equally impossible or equally likely as to turn a heterosexual person into a homosexual, which he considered impossible, but that's not what his disciples considered. His disciples were victims of general morality in which they lived in. They accepted heteronormativity. They accepted hegemonic masculinity. And they, unfortunately, some of them even participated in these futile and very dangerous uh, various forms of conversion therapies. Of course, they didn't make equal damage like certain uh, priests and people connected to the church who made, who were doing who knows what, including physical coercion, but still they participated. That, that part of the history of psychoanalysis is, of course, something that uh, is to be regretted. What happens? Psychoanalysts at that time are mainstreamers. They are main people in American Psychiatric Association. And it is the American Psychiatric Association which decides what is mental disorder and what is not. So if there are people who treat gay people believing that they should be converted into hetero people, you can't expect from them to say uh, it shouldn't be mental. Uh, uh, listed as a mental disorder. And then gay movement appears. So there are Stonewall riots in 1969 in New York. And then in 1917, disruption of the association, American Psychiatric Association, of their meeting in San Francisco, and also in 1971. And this encouraged the American Psychiatric Association, we'll go back to that later, to strip homosexuality from the list of mental disorders, actually to make a political compromise, but this was a very important move. And finally, after that, openly gay psychoanalysts may appear, and one of them is Richard Isay and his very famous book, 
being homosexual that was published in 1989. So now it is a total mainstream. But you see how many years it took after this original effort of Freud from 1920. 70 years for the psychoanalytic movement to accept it. And in 1997, finally, American Psychoanalytic Association, huge turn, became the first national mental health organization to support gay marriage. So huge changes actually happened uh, uh, in the last several decades. That was about America, but now let's go to Germany. In Germany, a great pioneer in sexology was Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld. One of the greatest sexologists ever, and the first open uh, LGBT, if I can call it that way, although I'm uh, modernizing things. But actually, he was really LGBT activist in, certain, in some aspects. He published his first pamphlet under pseudonym, Sapfo and Socrates, or how does one explain the love of men and women to people of their same sex, based on sexual intermediaries, like intermediary conditions, as opposed to the idea of the third gender, which has nothing to do with current trans and gender studies, but the third gender would be like men who are effeminate, which was insulting even for some gay, not activists, but people of gay orientation in, in cultural mainstream of German lands of that age. So he didn't go that way. He tried to explain it a bit different. And then groundbreaking work, which also opens up this avenue of gender studies, is his book, The Transvestiten, Transvestites from 1910. And for our topic, very important book, Homosexuality of the Man and the Woman from 1920. And finally, Sexual Anomalies and Perversions from 1938. He established the first institute for sexual sciences, Institut für Sexualwissenschaft, in Berlin in 1919. Excellent institute with huge library, museum of sexology, it was destroyed by Nazi youth immediately in 1933. Uh, he was uh, a Jew and openly homosexual and pacifist and globalist, all possible reasons. One of the most hated people by the Nazi party at that time altogether, fortunately, escaped from Germany. And of course, they uh, burnt. Freud's books as well, very soon after Nazis came to power. He established the World League for Sexual Reform, which had international conferences for sexual reform since 1921, gathering other famous sexologists. And he traveled all around the world. He was not Eurocentric at all. He was called, moreover, Vatsayana of the West by people in India, and he was called Dr. Einstein of Sex by Americans, as you can see uh, when this commemoration of him was made on his 150th birthday uh, recently. He is precursor to LGBT activists, was homosexual himself, and he had an affair with a Chinese student who you can see here of sexology who he met in Shanghai. And he made the first survey in incidents of homobite sexuality in 1903-1904, he got replies from 3,700 students and workers in Berlin, and he concluded 94% of people were exclusively hetero, 2.3 exclusively homosexual, and then the rest would be bisexual, 3.4. It was rather severely criticized that it's very small, but it's not very different from the data that we have today. Because the, this is exclusively hetero, exclusively uh, homosexual, exclusively bisexual. What are his main contributions to the understanding of homosexuality? First of all, he insisted, same-sex love was not a vulgar passion, 
but one capable of loyalty, commitment, and noble feelings as heterosexual love. Homosexuality was innate. He was severely criticized for that. In the 1970s, he was totally rejected. He was called pseudoscientist. Now he's back to mainstream. And very important thing, human desire is involuntary. We do not control it. If we do not control it, how can it be punishable by law? He just asked logical question. And then this World League uh, for Sexual Reform advocated sexual equality of men and women, liberalization of divorce, birth control, reasonable attitude to homosexuals, and insisted that sexual abnormalities are medical issue. They are not crimes, they are not vice, they are not sin. Of course, he was also a great pop proponent of eugenics, and I know that some of you will say, ah. But so were social democrats of his time. We have to leave, to go back to that age and understand. So that was mainstream and did not necessarily have sinister uh, plans or ideas behind it. And now we go to Germany. There was a long journey to decriminalization of homosexuality in Germany. Since the unification of Germany, a Prussian paragraph of, it, of their penal law was implemented throughout the Second Reich, German Reich. Paragraph 175 expressly outlawed anal sex between men in the period between 1871 and 1935. And the paragraph when Nazis came to power became even stricter. Even, you will see that Britain was actually absolutely the worst case ever. So uh, not as bad case as Britain, but also not a very good case either. Lesbian love was not outlawed. And then when they noticed at the climax of heteronormativity, oh, we forgot to add this. Then they said, let's add also, let's outlaw lesbian love as well. And Hirschfeld succeeded to prevent that amendment. Uh, Anti-homosexual paragraphs were relaxed in West Germany only in 1973 and totally eliminated in 1994 and then followed uh, this latest liberalization, same-sex partnership in 2001 and same-sex marriage in 2017. This is now a British case. Henry Havelock Ellis, a child of Victorian parents, Born in an era when masturbation was considered to be a disease, leading to impotence and blindness. At the age of 32, he still did not have sexual relations. His marriage was friendly. His wife was, was ambisexual, bisexual, and an activist for birth control. He published seven volumes in sexology, but some of them were banned by courts in Britain. Other volumes could be published in the USA, but only a restricted number of people could read them, doctors only. He was able to connect sex with love only at the age of 59. He's a real, real victim himself of Victorian morality. When he discovered that undinism, undinism, and I don't know how to present, that is his own creation, that word, was sexually attractive to him, watching his wife urinating. In the last two decades of his life, he observed with great joy the gradual disappearance of Victorianism, his lifelong enemy, which deprived him for decades of any sexual satisfaction. So what are his findings? He still calls homosexuality anomaly, and the most clearly defined of all sexual deviation. But he claims that it had natural basis, very important. It was manifested by its prevalence among animals. It is common among various mammals. And as we should expect, it is especially found among the primates, most nearly below man. So this kind of reasoning would 
really be in favor of uh, sensibilization to homosexuality. Of course, you should have in mind that Brits could not read these books originally. And then he referred to Kraft Ebbing. Kraft Ebbing uh, was uh, another Viennese who made Psychopathia Sexualis, lexicon of all perversions, back in 1886. And his original opinion on homosexuality was uh, rather in line with the Victorian era. But even Kraft Ebbing later minimized the importance of acquired homosexuality. So it was for this innate theory. So the question that Alice posed was, should sexual inversion, should homosexuality, even if congenital, be considered a morbid or degenerate state? And he says that, that in this matter, Kraft Ebbing in his latest writing considered inversion as an anomaly and not a disease or a degeneration. This is the direction in which modern opinion has steadily moved. Inverts may be healthy and normally all respects outside their special aberration. This has always been my own standpoint. This was, of course, for that age and for Britain, totally unacceptable. As you know, Britain chemically castrated Alan Turing after the Second World War, the man thanks to whom uh, the Allies won the Second World War. Uh, so sodomy in Britain was a very punishable criminal act, uh, which is the name for homosexual relations. and used in, in British laws, and it was punishable by capital punishment till 1861, but the last such case was made in 1845. Uh, and then there was Labouchere amendment to the criminal law in England in 1885, which introduced life sentence for a sodomite, and 10 years for attempting sodomy, and two years for gross indecency. Gross indecency, you didn't know, need to prove, like police would set their agent, that agent would approach you, would invite you to have some sort of date or whatever, and then there would be ambush nearby of an other four or five policemen, and that was enough. They would just make a report, and you would go to jail for two years. Oscar Wilde, by the way, was um, one of the victims of all of this. And what is important is that after this amendment, it is the climax of British Empire. That's the moment when it spreads all over the empire, including uh, Islamic states with Islamic tradition. Decriminalization took place only in 1967, but it was actually limited. It provided that sex was conducted in private consensually with both men over 21 was allowed. But that conducted in private was really literally taken. And some people could even go to jail for doing it uh, in certain apartments where someone else was present in another room or whatever. So age of consent was lowered only in 2001. Finally, civil partnership was allowed in 2005, and same-sex marriage in England, Wales, and Scotland in 2014, and in Northern Ireland in 2020. Today, of course, the United Kingdom is one of the main champions of uh, LGBT rights. But as you can see, only several decades ago, it was a very, very serious issue. And actually, there was there were really huge efforts of some MPs in the 1970s, in the 1980s, to lower the consent age. And it was always in the House of Lords or somewhere else that someone would stop it. So there was a huge cultural opposition. And to give you an example, there is a film called Morris, one of the first gay films, to call it that way, made in Britain in 1987 with James Walby and Hugh Grant. So James Al uh, Walby plays Morris, and they're students. One is 
bi, another is gay. Morris, so Morris decides to have a treatment with, with the hypnotizer. Of course, the hypnotizer immediately realizes what it is all about. And he says to Morris, look, maybe England is not for you. Maybe you should go somewhere where what you are is acceptable. Maybe Italy or France. And he looks at hypnotizer and says, what about Britain? And hypnotizer says, Britain, well, Britain has always been disinclined to accept human nature. So that is the description of 1914. And at that time, had you asked anyone, they would have believed that. That, that was a hopeless situation. Britain would never, ne ever accept. Uh, something like that, something that Victorian, Victorianism was particularly against. And now we come to America and the Kinsey reports. The Kinsey reports are the beginning of modern uh, sexology as a science. And uh, Dr. Alfred Kinsey made a huge sensation when he published these two reports with his uh, colleagues, Pomeroy, Martin, Gephardt, who were all sexologists, and Gephardt was also anthropologist. Uh, he had a huge male sample of 5,300 men and female sample of 8,000, 6,000, depending uh, who he interviewed and what. The whole thing is totally available. You can go to the institute, you can see samples, you can use software even today. Very huge survey. But legacy is uh, different. Those who oppose him uh, call him homosexual masochist, others call him objective scientist. Of course, it is not mutually exclusive. And as you can see here, he was on cover pages. It was a huge sensation. Someone talks about sex in America, in Puritan America. The book was sold, the first one, in 2,700 uh, 2, copies, second also. So more than half a million copies of these two books. So what did he say about homosexuality? First of all, masturbation among men is almost universal, 92 to 97%. Second, premarital coitus, so he basically debases Puritan morality. Premarital coitus was found among 22% of respondents. Around 50% of men had extramarital sex married men. Dominant homosexuals represented 13% of male population. The percentage of men who experienced orgasm caused by homosexual stimuli was 37. Men who reached old age without either homosexual orgasm or homosexual stimuli was 50% only. Since exclusive uh, heterosexuals were 50, and exclusive homosexuals four, he concluded that 46% what remains were bisexual, but only in this first volume. And then goes the second volume in 1953. It has, of course, chapters on masturbation, premarital sex, marital sex, etc. And everything is analyzed very scientifically. How does this look in animal world? How does this look among mammals? How does this look among uh, primates? And with anthropological evidence. So very comprehensive study. So in the second book, he noticed lower incidences of the homosexual ratings among women. A cumulative incidence of same-sex responses reached 28% among women versus 50% among men. So just be careful, not homosexual relations, not homosexual sense, homosex, sex, homosex, uh, same sex responses. Contacts leading to orgasm reached 30% among women, 37% among men. And those women who were homosexual, they were more restrictive in selecting same sex partners. One to two in 71% of cases than men. 
What's his contribution to this whole topic? First of all, these non-judgmental conclusions based on such a huge sample evidence, etc., they triggered the sexual revolution in the United States in the 1960s and 1970s in a very Puritan society. I will go back to it, but which by 1960 had anti-sodomy laws in every single of American states and which still has laws against masturbation. They're not effective, but they're still there in certain states. Alfred Kinsley himself was married, had four kids, but was actually bisexual. Of course, those scholars, scientists who do not accept, uh, who just have this dichotomy, homosexual, heterosexual, they call also everyone who is bisexual, homosexual. Kinsey's biographer claimed that he was a masochist and homosexual and he wanted to strip human sexuality of its guilt and repression. And one of his main associates, Paul Gephardt, who was also an anthropologist and sexologist, easygoing and an anecdotal person, he made a very realistic remark describing the situation. This is important to understand what was the mood in the United States. He gave this remark in 1969 on the position of gay population. He said, there is no question that homosexuality is a much more difficult way of life. Life is complicated enough as it is. Anyone who can avoid it would be wise to do so, he said. He himself, Gephardt, was homosexual, that was heterosexual, but he supported gay marriage. He died recently in 2015. And he famously said, I can't say we, heterosexuals, made a good job of marriage. Maybe they can, referring to uh, the discussion on the legalization of same-sex marriage. Gephardt also thought that Kinsey's greatest contribution was that he made it possible to talk about sex in the living room. Up to Kinsey, sex was discussed only in bedroom. It's now in the living room because TV, radio, press, everyone discusses Kinsey. So it's mainstream. It's a huge, huge cultural change. And this leads us finally to the de de medicalization of sexual deviations and homosexuality, which went hand in hand. And I already mentioned the American Psychiatric Association, which actually produces diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders known as DSM. DSM spoke about sexual deviations. perversions for earlier sexology. And they accepted the new term, paraphilia, in 1980. It's a landmark change. And finally, in the latest one from 2013, paraphilic behavior, it means BDSM, sadomaso, everything, which is not pathological, is within the range of normal, although normal is not used anymore, of course, in psychiatry. And it distinguishes it between paraphilic behavior, which is not pathological, and paraphilic behavior, which is exclusively pathological. So huge, huge change. And also concomitantly with that, the change about homosexuality. It was in 1973, DSM-2, that homosexuality was excluded from the list of mental disorders. However, SOD was still their sexual orientation disturbance, which regarded homosexuality as an illness only if an individual with same-sex attractions found them distressing and wanted to change. And finally, 1980, DSM-3 dropped SOD and substituted it with ego dystonic homosexuality, EDH, and the World Health Organization did the same in 1992. But what was happening behind was that there was a huge division within this community, the huge division within psychiatrists to accept or not to accept. And uh, 
all this that you can see here is the result of political um, kind of arrangements uh, between various factions of American psycho, psychiatric association. And now we go to cultural anthropology. Margaret Mead is probably the most famous cultural anthropologist of the 20th century. She was known as the first lady of American intelligentsia, one of the forerunners with Kinsey of the American sexual revolution. She basically spoke about plasticity of human nature. She was uh, one of the leaders of a movement within cultural anthropology that insisted, called cultural personality, that insisted that human societies were so diverse that there was not a single pattern. Every society was different. So because every society was different, we cannot even speak about something like um, human nature. It's different in every society. It's culturally relative. So she was one of the persons who introduced cultural relativism. This was very important because it means, translated into American terms, our morality, Puritan morality, is just one of possible moralities that humans can use. There are others. Let's see what we have on menu and perhaps make a new salad, to put it metaphorically. Also, she was groundbreaking many other things. Abnormal was relative. She noticed that in one society, something is considered schizophrenic. In another, it's totally normal. In one, something is delusional. In another, it's normal. So there are no abnormal things, but special things. Very, very inclusive. She had three husbands. That was known. You can find that in her autobiography. And at least two love affairs with women, so essentially was bisexual. One of them, the most famous lovers, was Ruth Benedict, her mentor. Another uh, participant in this uh, cultural school of cultural relativism. Uh, so, her book, groundbreaking book, Growing Up in Samoa, has subtitle A Psychological Studies of Primitive Youth for Western Civilization. So, she had a name. I will tell you how these people live because it has implications for Western civilization. And she said, growing up was not a difficult task, which everyone actually considered it was in America. Growing up was a difficult task in America because America had sexually repressive morality, but it's not in Samoa. She claimed to have witnessed their general casualness of the whole society, and in this casualness, Samoa constructed strongly with America. And therefore, she had the conclusion, realizing that our own ways are not humanly inevitable, nor God-ordained, but are the fruit of a long and turbulent history, we may well examine in turn all of our institutions thrown into strong relief against the history of other civilizations, and weighting them in the balance, be not afraid to find them wanting. In other words, there are societies without sexual repression. Why not copy them? So Samoans became like a cultural icon of sexual revolution, feminism, and many other things. Cur Interpretation led to sexual liberalization and hybridity. By the time her interpretation and the lack of field method were discovered, her cultural relativism had already been widely accepted. So uh, what happened in the meantime was that she had a lifelong opponent who actually established that she made some things in anthropological terms wrong. The way how she interviewed members of Samoan society. But nonetheless, this main point that 
some things, many things, most things or almost everything for her were culturally relative. If we only take that, that is enough. In peculiarities, however, a lot of her ethnographies are now challenged. Med belonged to cultural mainstream. She even participated, she was a very active uh, believer, a member of the Episcopalian Church of America. Uh, she contributed to prayer book of the Episcopalian Church. So that is, of course, the reason why she couldn't have spoken openly about some aspects of her sexuality, which were, by the way, as you have already heard, illegal at that time in the United States, in one way or other, or at least morally totally unacceptable. In this other book, she contrasted free societies, free traditional societies, and again, in one, women had huge influence, huge power, in the other, they didn't. In one, men looked like nannies. In the other, they looked like warriors. So her suggestion was, look, it's all culturally relative. It can be A, B, C. So our society is the one, just one among many, and it can be very different. And then the next important moment is when this book was published, Patterns of Sexual Behavior. compiled by Clellan Ford and Frank Beach, two professors of the University of Yale. The first was anthropologist, the second was et etologist, uh, researcher of animal behavior. And what they say in this book is that patterns of sexual behavior in the, in, on their covers places the findings of Dr. Kinsey, another specialist in the broader perspective. So you can see how important this first Kinsey's book from 1948 has become. Any subsequent work had to make reference to it. Findings based on the sample of 190 contemporary societies, contemporary, not modern, meaning both traditional and modern states, uh, were made. And conclusion was that sexual patterns vary sharply from one society to another. So chapter 7 is entitled Homosexual Behavior in which the authors say, our own society disapproves of any form of homosexual behavior for males and females of all ages. In this, it differs from the majority of human societies. Some peoples resemble us in this respect, but a larger number condone or even encourage homosexuality for at least some members of its population. Despite social and legal barriers to such behavior, Homosexual activities do occur among some American men and women. And what did they found in their sample? In 94 out of 76 societies, which is almost two thirds, other than our own, for which information was available, homosexual activities of one sort and another are considered normal and socially acceptable for certain members of the community. So speaking of the so-called natural family, which is now a very huge topic in Serbia, Romania, and some other countries in the region, they basically said they're very, very different experiences in different cultures. So a very, very important book. And later, this anthropological evidence only accumulated. But there was a reaction of uh, Christian fundamentalists who established something called the moral majority, a block of right-wingers led by Jerry Falwell. And you can see what was their aim. Uh, the moral majority versus homosexuality, equal rights amendment, abortion rights, strategic arms limitations. It was all together. We should have a nuclear armament and destroy LGBT. It was together. And some of them went th that far that they even proclaimed Antichrist to be homosexual on the basis of the book of Daniel, where Antichrist refuses female charms, so therefore he must be homosexual. Uh, but actually they won, as you know, recently, at least this battle about abortion, or at least uh, 
on the federal level, but there is now already a reaction in American society and many states, although they have Republican majority, did not introduce legislation against abortion. Anyway, to finish with the anthropologist, the first scholar in the USA who has been at the same time a researcher, an LGBT activist, anthropologist, is Esther Newton, and her PhD and book, Mother Camp, Female Impersonators in America, published in 1972 and again in 79, it explored gender performativity and sexual identity. And then her second book, is a gay ethnography called Cherry Grove, Fire Island, 60 years in America's first gay and lesbian town. If you remember uh, the film um, Normal Heart, it starts at um, Fire Island, at, exactly at the time when AIDS epidemic begins. She raised substantial standards of what inclusiveness of LGBT community meant, so not the so-called conservative tolerance, but something much more about it. And she introduced gay and lesbian topics to American anthropology and the new discipline, queer anthropology. Uh, she was the only out gay or lesbian professor from 1974 through the early 1990s, against like with psychoanalysts, the 1980s are a huge change. And finally, we have statement of the American Anthropological Association. Also, it took some years until it was accepted, which is a reaction to a campaign by President George Bush Jr. for a constitutional amendment that was supposed to ban gay marriage as a threat to civilization. So it was not, it was not very recently. So not to think that only in this region you can hear some strange wordings. They are actually, they come from very top uh, politicians in uh, very, very developed countries of the world. So the results of, this, this is the statement, the results of more than a century of anthropological research on households, kinship, relationships, and families across cultures and through time provide no support whatsoever for the view that either civilization or viable social orders depend upon marriage as an exclusively heterosexual institution. Rather, anthropological research supports the conclusion that the vast array of family types, including families built upon same-sex partnerships, can contribute to stable and humane societies. The executive board of the American Anthropological Association strongly opposes a constitutional amendment limiting marriage to heterosexual couples. So a very important moment. And of course, in terms of decriminalization, only France decriminalized it back in 1791. The Netherlands also very early, although they had some limits later. The Ottoman Empire, in 1858, very early because it was not against, it was not so uh, much against Islamic cultures. As I said, British Empire created that impression at the end of the 19th century. Italy in 1889, 1890, and now you understand why Morris, why in this film Morris uh, hypnotizer tells him, go to Italy or France, he could have gone only there. However, in America, by 1960, every single U.S. state had its own anti-sodomy law. And the individual American federal state decriminalized same-sex relations during the period of 40 years. And even at the end of that period, when the Supreme Court intervened, still 14 states had such laws. And some even continued, tried at least, to implement it even after this decision, although now it's impossible. So, what happened, what led to this change was sexual revolution in the West. The army lost primary ro role in shaping masculinity over that time since the 1960s. Men gradually gained rights to be conscientious objectors, deserters, to refuse to serve their fatherland. Feminism gained ground. Women got rights to vote to abortion and gender equality became a major social issue. So all these elements contributed to the defeat of hegemonic masculinity in the West and a huge change in America. Only 
25 years ago, and actually until about 2008, there was a stable majority against gay marriage. But the latest uh, opinion polls conducted just a few weeks ago suggest that 71% of Americans at this moment support uh, same-sex marriages. And basically there are two landmark decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States, Lawrence versus Texas, with six to three votes, which made consexual sex, same-sex conduct legal everywhere in the United States. Even same-sex conduct was not legal in all the states by 2003. And then Obergefell versus Hodges in June 2015, very narrow victory, five to four, that obliged all the US federal states to accept same-sex marriages. And this is the situation right now. This is the situation which shows you a huge difference between Eastern and Western uh, Europe. Uh, this is only about Catholic population, by the way. It's only Roman Catholic population. But you can see that once a great opponent of anything dealing with uh, LGBT rights, by the way, the Catholic Church reacted with its own encyclopedia against Kinsey and with a, a pamphlet, with a, a book called Il Peccato, The Sin, uh, in 1959 in Rome, but uh, even traditional Catholic countries like Ireland or Austria or Spain, 75%. So that there was a major change which still has not affected Eastern Europe. And finally, just to finish with this, something about Serbia. In Serbia, since 19... 82, Professor Ljubomir Eric openly endorsed the medicalization of homosexuality, which was soon accepted in psychiatric mainstream. So uh, that was accepted concomitantly with the change in 1980, very much thanks to him. Then followed the criminalization of uh, homosexual relations in 1994, uh, removal of the list of diseases, mental disorders in 1997, anti-discrimination law in 2009, which forbids discrimination based on sex, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, sexual characteristics. And, however, no laws on same-sex partnership and gender identity. So, what can we say in the conclusion? These two disciplines really changed something that looked unchangeable 120 years ago to someone who lived in Britain or the United States, not to mention smaller countries. And uh, you can see that actually, if we would make a timeline, things have acceleration over time, especially in the last few decades. So in not a single of these countries, this one is easy issue, even in the most developed. And therefore, one should not be surprised to see this, what we can see here as the result of opinion polls, because had similar opinion polls been conducted 50 years ago, in some of the countries where uh, gay marriages, gay rights are now generally acknowledged, that researcher would have got actually very similar results to the one that you see here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Slobodan, very much for uh, an interesting and uh, long lecture. I like long lectures myself. So uh, now we move to the part when we ask the audience whether they have some questions or comments. Please don't be shy. Hello. Do we have some research data from Asia, China, India, Far East, in general, South East Asia, whatever? Because this is mainly uh, Western civilization. <clears throat> well, one of the four uh, 
founders of sexology was a Japanese, Shinozaki. So certainly in, in Japan, uh, research of this kind was conducted for years. India, again, is an Anglophone country, so again, uh, very much into this research. Hirschfeld himself traveled to China, India, and everywhere else, and had his own disciples there. So basically, uh, through cultural transfers, these things were discussed in those societies by their intellectuals, even back in the 1930s. So yes, we do have, but I uh, couldn't have included them. And uh, I just, you know, it was a bit longer because I wanted to include several people like, and then if I don't include this or that, uh, would be perhaps I should have selected only one of the two disciplines, it would have been easier, but basically their interaction contributed to this, what I wanted to describe. So yes, we do have and uh, equally good like this, not uh, someone of, of the same, uh, with the same magnitude like Kinsey, but uh, uh, Shinozaki was equally important, for instance, in Japan. So, uh, uh, and of course, India had their own. So, uh, yes, there are. There are also Spanish, very famous sexologists, etc. I didn't mention them. And, South American societies were also among the first to decriminalize same-sex uh, conduct. So, uh, yes, we should not be Eurocentric, definitely, but uh, uh, since this is your pride and uh, we speak about Serbia, it has to be in the European context. And basically as a kind of hope, because if these societies that had very, very deeply <coughs> antagonistic views to homosexuality, bisexuality, uh, only recently could have been transformed that much, then these Eastern European societies actually could do the same. That, that was my intention. That's why I have been so focused on Europe and America. Thank you. Okay, then, then I have um, I have a, a comment uh, um, uh, from what you presented us here. We can see that there is like a linear progression line in the 20th century when it comes to we can put it widely as as gay rights. Uh, but with the emergence of uh, Trump in America and with the emergence of Putin and what is going on in Russia um, that is all reflecting on the Serbian situation as well. And we can see that the Euro Pride has been banned after several years of not being banned. Can we um, be optimistic or pessimistic uh, when uh, we think about how this line will continue? I, I, I personally am pessimistic about that because I see that we are living in a sort of a neo-Victorian society where people are getting more and more conservative. What, what do you think about that? Well, uh, <clears throat> this decision of the Supreme Court looked like a landmark victory for people like uh, American fundamentalists, but actually in reality, it doesn't look like that. There is a kind of mutiny among Republicans, some Republicans at least. They already blocked in certain countries, in certain states, and uh, new legislation. And uh, the recent most polls suggest that uh, uh, those uh, Republicans who very much insist on, on uh, total ban of abortion actually lose huge parts of the electorate. So uh, that would suggest that the Supreme Court uh, that basically claimed that it wasn't grounded in American uh, whatever uh, system was wrong after so many years it was. So I wouldn't be that pessimistic about America, although when you read uh, what uh, Christian fundamentalists say and uh, the percentage of people who support them, you can also be pessimistic. Uh, but if you look Spain, at Spain, that shows you a totally different perspective. One country that was among the most conservative ones in the 1970s, not in the 17th century or 18th century, but less than 50 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, has really had tremendous, tremendous change. 
And uh, by the way, even in the studies of masculinity, uh, when we say that uh, hegemonic masculinity was defeated, usually it's added, but in Mediterranean societies it still exists. But look what happened in Spain, another Mediterranean society. So uh, I think that uh, what we witness is hybridity and not uh, going into one or other direction, because generally in, in uh, political sphere, we see that ideologies do not operate as they did 30 or 40 years ago. And uh, there, and we see hybridity in Serbia as well. Uh, very different uh, um, messages are sent by politi same politicians, even at the same press conference. So uh, that, uh, of course, um, some are very endorsing, some are very disappointing. So, uh, but overall, uh, I, I don't believe in linear progression, just to mm -hmm. be clear about that. Okay. But uh, I think that at least in these societies that were hugely affected by Enlightenment ideas, I think it, it will go that way simply because patterns were repeated and repeated. And after all, all those people who, uh, specialists, who somehow disappeared from public discourse in Serbia, Romania, and elsewhere. Once they are back, people of the same importance like Professor Erich, they are there to, to bring all these topics back to this uh, uh, Euro-Atlantic mainstream and, and what is happening in their society for the last 40 years. So from that point of view, with some cautiousness, I would be an optimist. Oh, that's a question. Um, wait, wait. Um, I don't know. If it... Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So, uh, my name is Milos, and my question is about uh, the vision and faith of some of them being quite recent, the whole frenzy about the, the issue. Well, it's. Uh... Conservative tolerance, I would say. That's new, by the way, for the Roman Catholic Church. So it's good, it should be supported. Uh, and uh, everyone hoped that it would affect uh, their Orthodox brethren as well, if you have it so far. Uh, so, yes, it's a very huge change. It's short of supporting gay marriage, but it is, uh, it accepts homosexuals as a part of the church and uh, uh, people equipped with all other rights except uh, the holy secret of marriage, as uh, it would be viewed from theological point of view. Uh, so it's it's a great improvement, uh, and um, also you can see that um, uh, basically they have the data that I showed that in the most developed countries where most of Roman Catholics live, in most of them, actually, there is uh, total support for everything. That affects the church as well. So Pope Francis actually is uh, in line with uh, contemporary trends. Although you could say, if you look to this, that also these uh, church leaders in these societies are in line with the results, uh, But uh, if, if you would argue that way. But uh, obviously, he has, except in Poland and Hungary and Latvia and Lithuania, sorry, because Lithuania is Catholic, and Lithuania, uh, he has, uh, Pope Francis has a bit different situation, especially in the United States, especially in, in Western Europe. So, uh, um, again, very huge change in the last several decades. So, would actually speak uh, in favor of certain progression with all cautiousness. Well, um, um, if uh, there are no further questions, I would like to thank again Slobodan Markovic uh, for an inspiring lecture. 
And I would like to thank you for being here with us. Uh, we continue tomorrow at uh, 5 p.m. with the lecture by uh, Gillian Pope, uh, dealing uh, with drag performances in the context of our post-socialist uh, reality. See you tomorrow. Bye.